Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to read verses 11 through 19. It says, Now it happened as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were they not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. I want to preach this morning on this thought, forgetting to give thanks. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, I need your anointing. I need you to give me your unction, Holy Spirit, to speak a word, to encourage us, to challenge us, to bring us, Lord, to this time of altar, Lord, to seek your face, Father. I pray that you would put in us, Lord, a thankful heart, Father, to truly worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Forgetting to give thanks. I've said many times, and I believe it to be true, that true worship only flows from a thankful heart. That if you truly are a person that will worship God, it flows from a heart of gratitude and thankfulness to Him. Now it's possible to be excited about something, but not necessarily thankful for it. All ten of these lepers were healed. All ten were excited about it. All ten encountered the presence of God and left changed by His goodness. But only one of those lepers stopped to give thanks and to worship the Lord. How often do we give thanks? How often do we remember in, in our moments of our lives when God's been good to us or, or when God's brought us through something to turn around and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for bringing me through it, God. Thank you that you've been so good to me. I grew up most of my life in Beaumont, Texas. And while living there, it seemed that every couple years we experienced uh, one of those devastating things called a hurricane. And specifically, uh, we got hit hardest with Hurricane Rita, and uh, Hurricane Andrew hit us probably the, the second hardest. But I remember specifically after Hurricane Rita that we drove back into town several weeks after it happened and, and just saw all the devastation that it caused. It was absolutely amazing. I remember seeing gas stations that were flipped upside down. I remember seeing trees and billboards that looked like toothpicks just absolutely shredded into splinters. I remember a house on my street that was completely destroyed and there was nothing but pieces of wall standing on a concrete foundation. I remember the next several weeks uh, as we were there, we lived under martial law where there was military personnel with machine guns posted at the grocery stores and the gas stations. And it was just absolutely a, a crazy time there. I remember for weeks we lived without power and, and clean drinking water and, and food. And, you, and you, you know what? You sure miss the AC in the summertime when you don't have it. Amen, Sister Joe. Uh, there's times where you take for granted some things so, uh, when you have them. But it's amazing the kind of gratitude that comes into your heart when you have to do without that which you've taken for granted for so long. It's amazing how whenever you begin to understand this is something that I have had for so long and I've had it for so long that I actually forgot what it was like to live without it and to be grateful that I have it and realize that not everyone has this. But why is it that we wait to be thankful and grateful for things until we've lost them? Many times we do that with people as well. We take family members for granted until they're on their deathbed. And then we wish we cherished them a little more. Why does it take a funeral many times to wake us up to the fact that none of us are here forever? Psalms 90 verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It said that your time on earth is God's gift to you. 
And what you do with it is your gift back to God. Amen. You have one life to live. Each and every one of us have one life to live. You know, we ministered at a church in Alabama, and there was a uh, cemetery right next to the church, a very large one. And several of the graves actually went back to even early 1900s and, and maybe a few beyond that. And I remember walking through the cemetery and looking at all these different grave sites and, and these different headstones and seeing a number, a dash, and another number. And the, what's so important that we need to understand is the only thing that matters in this life is what happens in that tiny little dash. That's the only thing that matters. And when that time is over, it's over. And so we need to take a, a serious account of our lives and most specifically be thankful for the time that we have on this planet that God has given us. I believe one of the greatest ways to live is in a continual state of thankfulness. Realizing that every breath we breathe is a gift from God. So let me ask you, have you remembered to give thanks? Oftentimes the only time we give thanks is around the dinner table. And that's really only a formality that we've learned to do as Christians. There's an old hymn that says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. See, I think if we took time to see how blessed we are, I think it would produce in us a thankful heart. I think if we just took time to look and take an account of our lives, how much we have, how much we're blessed with. I put this on our church Facebook page uh, the other week. But it, the statistic is if you have running water in your house, if you have electricity, if you have a roof over your head, if you have a vehicle that you can drive, you are among the 7% of the wealthiest in the world. Even if you're poor, you are among the 7 wealthiest in the world, the 7%. Isn't that amazing? And we don't think of it that way. We think of ourselves even as struggling many times, and, and, and granted it's a proportion to uh, where we live and things like that. I understand that. But many times we take for granted the things that people other places are praying for. Amen. Don't let a blessing that God's given you be something that you take for granted that somebody else wishes they had. There's people around this world that wish they had running water. They wish they had a roof over their heads. They wish they had a heater in the wintertime and an AC during the summertime. We're so blessed in so many ways. We're blessed with family and friends. People in our lives that come alongside us to live life and experience the joys and the pains that we experience in this life. We're blessed with a roof over our heads, as I said, with running water, electricity, heat in the winter and cool air in the summer. But what about when we're hurting, Pastor Mark? Where are the blessings then? There was a wonderful woman of God named Annie Johnson Flint. She was a school teacher for a few years until her health started failing. She developed a severe arthritis which grew steadily worse until it became difficult for her to walk at all. It set it to the point where she was forced to give up her work teaching, which she loved so much. And shortly after this, she was faced with the death of both of her adoptive parents within a few months of each other. And she had very little money to live on, but she trusted God to provide for her. And in the midst of her pain, she penned these beautiful words. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied sorrows, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed, ere the day is half done. When we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. How powerful is that? It wasn't written by somebody who had it all together and, and was, it was living the high life. It was somebody in the midst of their pain and their suffering still took time to see the blessings and the goodness of God even in the midst of their pain, even in the midst of what they were going through. They were still able to raise holy hands and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Just like Job, in the midst of his suffering, he was still able to say, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know that I will stand before 
before Him one day and see Him face to face, I know that I will experience the glory of God in my life. And in that moment, at the end of Job's uh, time of trial, he says, I've heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Listen, it's not necessary that God gives you an explanation of why you're going through what you're going through. The most important thing you can receive from God is a revelation of His goodness, a revelation of His glory and of His power in your life. Even in the midst of her pain, she found the blessing of His strength, of His grace, and of His presence. I've said this many times in ministering, that there's aspects of the nature and the character of God that you cannot know unless you go through things. I would never know Him as the healer if I was never sick. I would never know Him as the comforter if I was never hurting. I would never know Him as the provider if I was never lacking in His provision. I would never know of the goodness of His character unless I'd seen it in the times when I failed Him so miserably. I would never know about His mercy if I had not ever come to the place where I messed up and I needed that mercy and that grace. But there's aspects of who God is and we need to be thankful for Him and grateful for Him because He's good to us and we see that as we walk through this life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.4, I always thank my God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. Psalms 107, 8 and 9 says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for mankind. For He satisfies the thirsty and He fills the hungry with good things. He said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He said, You're not going to come into my presence and leave out empty. You're going to come in and I'm going to pour into your cup and I'm going to pour into your cup and I'm going to pour in until your cup is overflowing with the goodness and the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? We can thank God because every time we come into His presence, regardless of what we're going through, He will fill us with His joy and His peace and His love. Hallelujah. When we come into the house of God with thankfulness and worship, His presence meets us there. He inhabits the praises of His people. He's looking, the Bible says in the Gospel of John, for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's looking for true worshipers who will worship Him, not just because of what He's done, but because of who He is. Because of who He is, He's worthy. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship You because of who You are. You're worthy of my worship in the good times. You're worthy of my worship in the bad times. You're worthy in every situation. So I choose to worship God. Hallelujah. 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 Psalms 100 and verse 4 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and in His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. When we come into the house of God, we need to come in with thanksgiving, even in the midst of our circumstances. As Sister Teresa always says, someone always has it worse than us. So we have a reason to praise. We have a reason to worship God. Lastly, if you can't think of one thing to be thankful for, be thankful for the cross. Be thankful for that the Son of God laid aside His glory and came down to a fallen world to be the sacrifice for our sins. Let us be thankful that even though He didn't have to, the Son of God willingly laid down His life for us. He took our sin. He took our sorrow. He took our pain on Himself. And He offers the gift of salvation that's so costly that the richest king cannot afford it. But He gives it to the poorest man freely. To all who would believe. To all who would receive. I said in the beginning of this message, I truly believe true worship is only born out of a thankful heart. Because the only proper reaction we can have when we see a Savior bleeding and dying on a cross for us is thankfulness. It's worship. 
and say, God, you didn't have to, but you sent your son, and the son willingly laid down his life. So the only proper reaction is worship. The great man of God, A.W. Tozer, once said, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God, that any man or woman on earth who is bored or turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. I've been in church services where people are bored to death as they're singing Amazing Grace, as they're singing When I Think About the Lord. I don't know about you, but I've never gotten over it. I had a pastor friend of mine, he was preaching, and somebody said to him, why are you so excited about the Word of God? Why are you so excited about the cross? It's like you got saved yesterday. He says, I didn't get saved yesterday. I just never got over it. And may God help us if we ever get over the cross, if we get ever get over the blood of Jesus, if we ever get over... What he did for us on Calvary. I should be in hell this morning. But because of his mercy and his grace. He lifted me up out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. And I have a reason to praise him. I have a reason to thank him. I have a reason to worship at his feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't believe a person that is nonchalant about the cross. And about Jesus' sacrifice is even born again, much less going to heaven. You can't take something so precious, so wonderful, and look at it as nothing. We have a generation that has to be pumped up with loud music, flashing lights, and fog machines in order to worship Jesus. But I believe with all my heart that if that's what it takes to get you to worship, you're not in love with Jesus, you're in love with the music concert. But there's those, <laughs> oh, my brothers and sisters in Africa, in the Middle East, they might not have a guitar, they might not have a piano, but they'll say, let's sing, let's worship Jesus, even if it's just our voices reaching up to heaven, and then the glory of God begins to fall. Why? Because God doesn't care about the sound of the music. He cares about the heart of the worshiper that says, God, you're worthy. I'm thankful for what you've done for me. I might not have an organ or a piano, but I can still lift my voice in praise because the rocks are not going to cry out in my place. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to be thankful for all that you've done and how good you You've been to me. Oh, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If we have a thankful heart, no one will have to beg us to worship. No one will have to beg us to pray and spend time with Jesus. Our heart will long to do this. No one has to beg me to spend time with my wife. I love being with her. I love her presence in my life. And the same is with Jesus. No one has to beg me to go into His presence. I long to be there. I want to be in His presence. I'm like Paul who's longing to be in heaven. But for this time is necessary to be on earth until God's done with me. But my heart, my home is in heaven. I'm looking for a city with foundations whose builder and maker is God. So until that time comes, I'm going to worship Him and be thankful and grateful. He's been good to me. Has he been good to you? First Chronicles 16.34 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. I tell you what, there's nothing that inspires thankfulness or gratitude in my heart more than understanding and knowing that He's good to me. His love is enduring. His mercy is enduring. He's not up in heaven waiting for you to strike out. He's up there in heaven not waiting for you to strike out. He's up in heaven cheering you on saying, just keep going. Just keep fighting. Just keep going. Because He's good. Have you remembered to give thanks this morning? God blesses us continually, but do we ever stop and take time to thank Him and worship at His feet? Every day He blesses us. Psalm 68, 19 said, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Selah. 
God sent His Son to save us, to rescue us, and through Him, blesses us every day. George Herbert once said this, The owl who has given me so much, give me one more thing, a thankful heart. Think about that. Thou who has given me so much, give me one more thing, a thankful heart. Ten lepers came to Jesus, begging for Him to help them. Jesus helped them, but only one stopped and remembered to give thanks. Are we that one? Or are we the nine that were blessed, happy, and ignorant of just how good God's been to us? I don't want to just say thank you at the dinner table, but every day I want to thank God that I'm alive, that I'm saved, born again, and on my way to heaven. There's an old Christian song that says, I am blessed, I am blessed. Every day that I live, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning or I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. Hallelujah. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. This world doesn't know what it means. They put it all over social media. I'm hashtag blessed. You don't know what blessed is until you've been born again. Until you have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. You don't know what blessed is until you know that you walk away from an altar that your sins are forgiven that your burdens rolled away that you're going to heaven that you're right with God sometimes we need to remember sometimes we need to look back and say God I remember I remember I could take you to the exact moment I could take you to the exact place 15 years ago in Beaumont, Texas at an old-fashioned altar where I gave my heart to Jesus and He saved me. He filled me with the Holy Spirit and called me to preach this great gospel. I look back and I remember I look back on the last 15 years of being saved and preaching this gospel and I've seen His faithfulness every day, every minute, every hour. He's been faithful. He's been good. He's been good to me. And because of that, because of all of that, I say thank you. When I think about the Lord, how He's been so good, how He saved me, kept me, filled me with His Spirit, used me for His glory. Let me tell you something, the church, we have a reason to be thankful this morning. We have a reason to worship. We have a reason to praise Him. I'm amazed that you love